Welcome, everybody, to Navigating Change, the podcast from Tybal Inc. I'm Pete Wright, and I'm here, as ever, with Howard Tybal. Pete Wright, how are you today? I'm so good. Do you want to know why? I do. Because today, with our guest on the show today, yes. you are the senior member of the panel. You mean age-wise? We're yeah. talking senior? Yeah. yeah. You're the oldest guy on the show. Yeah, and uh, but I've noticed in the past, more recently, you've had some more senior moments. <laughs> I might be senior, but let's be honest. If people are listening carefully, just listen for those senior moments. Senior, that you through. you know not w- of what you speak, sir. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll I'll find some examples. Oh, I, I look forward to that. The gauntlet right. has been thrown today. Here we go. <laughs> today on navigating change, we welcome Manu Narayan to the show. Manu is a truly Renaissance man. He's an actor of stage and screen. He's an accomplished musician. He's a writer. He's a producer. Uh, and as much as the film nerd in me wants to dig into Manu's work in Hollywood today, that is not why he's here. In fact, Manu also serves as the young alumni trustee on the board of Carnegie Mellon University, and is easily the youngest trustee guest ever to be on this show. Manu Narayan, welcome to Navigating Change. Hey, thank you, Pete. Thank you, Howard. How are you all? Very good, and very glad that you are here. Absolutely. Before we dig uh, right in, uh, make sure to head over to tybalink.com to learn more about us and this show. Subscribe for free in iTunes, and uh, you know, there's a back catalog of like 117 other episodes that you should should check out. If you really want to binge... You should binge on Navigating Change. Uh, And uh, you can find us, join the conversation on Twitter at Howard Teibel or find Teibel Inc. on LinkedIn. We would love to hear from you. Okay, Uh, so here we are. I get this uh, email from Howard. He says, uh, you'll never guess who I sat down with at Chautauqua. We've got to have this guy on the show. He's a trustee. He has an incredibly great story about how he ended up on the board. Howard, tell us how you met. Manu. I'm, so I'm sitting at dinner with my wife, and we're overlooking a beautiful night at uh, the Italian Fisherman. Remember this night, Manu? I sure and you're do. Sitting, yes. you're, you're at one table over, and I can't remember if I had already seen. I, I think no, we hadn't yet seen our town, and he was the stage manager in our town at the Playhouse, and we struck up a conversation. And I discovered that Banu is a trustee, and I share with him about the work that we're doing in higher education. And we both sort of just took that opportunity to dive into learning about each other's craft. So it's been, it was it was it was a serendipity, yet one of those great moments. You know those moments you meet somebody, you go, you know what? It's nice to you have these experiences where you just connect with somebody for the first time and it came out of nowhere. So Manu, I, I'm just so appreciative of uh, of the dialogue we had and there was no question that you bring something, I, I think, to the higher ed experience at the strategic senior level that that is such an important thing that most institutions need to do more of and that is in bring that level of youth and diversity. So I think what would be great for you to start off, you shared this with me, but it's a great story, is how you became a trustee of Carnegie Mellon after having been a student of the school. Well, uh, um, Howard, my the feeling is mutual meeting you. I thought uh, you and your wife, Pam, are such lovely people. And uh, it's that we had this connection in common um, was touching, and then I'm glad we have met. Uh, so... I am a graduate of Carnegie Mellon University from the music school, School of Music. Um, yeah, I did a double degree in saxophone and voice and, you know, was always an actor during that time um, and then moved out and started acting as my career uh, and continuing some of the music stuff. Uh, somewhere in 2004, when I was starring on Broadway, uh, one of the advancement people started making overtures to me and just including me more in the alumni outreach and, and stuff like that. And they had asked me a couple of times to uh, be an MC or speaker, sing at events. And one of the big ones was a, a, a capital campaign, the kicking off of a capital campaign of a billion dollars we were raising at the time. And I, I said, of course, yes, number one, Carnegie Mellon's in my hometown, so I get a chance to see my parents. But I love the school, and my experience at Carnegie Mellon in the College of Fine Arts was fantastic. It was life-changing, and it was uh, it was everything that one could hope it could be. 
Uh, so yeah, I had no problem doing that. Then about three years later, we were having the 100th year anniversary of the School of Music and the head of the School of Music and uh, and one of my professors asked me if I would MC the event. It was going to be at the Benedum Center, which in Pittsburgh is the, the big, uh, big, beautiful theater downtown, uh, holds 2,000 some seats. And then it was also going to be broadcast on uh, public radio. And then we were doing it at Carnegie Hall in New York. I said yes. So through these events, at that point, the president of the university at the time, Jerry Cohen, Jared Cohen, uh, took note. And, you know, I, I'd seen him at a few events. So I got an email about two years later saying from his secretary, Dr. Cohen would love to schedule a meeting to talk to you regarding trusteeship. I had no idea what that meant. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 was, I thought, I, I wasn't sure it was, to me, so vague because I don't, being a artist and sometimes starving artist and sometimes, uh, you know, very successful artist, uh, being on a, a trustee of a university never came into my um, line of sight. That, wait, that wasn't what you've been, since you were a young boy, your long uh, dream of yeah. youth has now been realized. That's not where we are in the story. Uh, yes, no, that's not, <laughs> uh, unfortunately. <laughs> but I, I, I'll be honest, you know, and cut a long story short, uh, I talked to a few people. They said, listen, uh, people I trusted, they said, if it's about being a trustee of the university, you, it's, the, it's one of the biggest honors People are, around the country are vying for and actively lobbying to get on the trustees of a lot of universities and colleges, and Carnegie Mellon's a top 20 school. So you, if it's about that, then you should definitely jump at the chance. And I had a long conversation with Dr. Cohen, and he explained to me this young alumni trusteeship, which was fairly new. I think I'm only the fourth or fifth person in this position. Um, and he had seen a need for a younger, uh, more, uh, in touch voice in touch, meaning in touch with what the university is now voice on the board, uh, and a way to, to, you know, skew the board younger. And, uh, and he thought I would be a good addition to the board. I was kind of flabbergasted, but I jumped at the opportunity and, you know, whether I've improved Carnegie Mellon or not, I don't think I have because I'm, you know, but what it's given to me has been just such a big bounty. I'm so see that, thankful. See, that's, you know, that's so perfect that it has that quality of you're getting back as much, if not more, than what you're giving. But I can tell you that having served on supporting lots of different board senior leaders uh, internally is that one of the growing needs is for boards to really dig into understanding what the student, the, the current student and the student in the future is looking for, what they need, how to engage them. So, so I think it's a very forward-thinking approach for Carnegie Mellon to create not just an alumni trusteeship, but this young alumni trusteeship because I'm sure when you sit around the room – you're looking at people with an incredible uh, wealth of knowledge and skills and background, and, and I'm sure that in itself is engaging and exciting. But I can tell you that they are looking at you as somebody that is more in touch with who these students are. Are you t Tell us a little bit about how that is, how that's evolving for you, being both the learning but also giving back. What, what, what's that been like? Uh, it's been, it's opened up my mind to so many more possibilities than the laser-like focus I need to be an actor. <laughs> and, and it's been fantastic to get, first of all, everybody on the board, when you look at their resumes, it's it's scary to be in the room with people like, <laughs> like David Tepper or like Ray Lane or, you know, so many other people. And, but th they couldn't be nicer and more welcoming. <laughs> yes, and exactly. For me, one of the, the big joys and kind of out-of-body experiences has been to meet people whose buildings I was in. <laughs> the name is Oh, like the their building. name is on it. Oh, my yeah. God. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you are talking to legacy. That's yeah. fantastic. Well, and people who have really invested their time, their energy, and their family 
into the building of Carnegie Mellon. That's huge. Yeah. That's something that whether you're on the name of a building or not, what's wonderful to be in a room with is a bunch of people who are solely committed to the betterment of the university. And that's fantastic. We all have the same passion and excitement for the university. And, you know, th that that's apparent in every meeting. In terms of the... Uh you know, the experience of being on the other side, having been a student at Carnegie Mellon, what are you, what are you discovering being on this other side of it? You know, the, the business of running a university, you know, if you think about the role of, uh, of, a, of a board, it's first and foremost, they're the fiduciary. They really are the ones that are responsible for the ongoing health and sustainability of the institution. And then through shared governance, uh, there's a, this model of how we get to decision making. But now that you're on the side of being part of this body, sort of engaged in those kind of conversations, what are, what are some of the kind of conversations that you discovering are discovering are showing up in board meetings that you attend that get you excited? Well, I mean, uh, it's eye-opening to be on the uh, trustee or the leadership side because I, I think so many people think that tuitions are so high and why why are tuitions so high and why, uh, why does everything cost so much at a university uh, or a college? And being on the inside, you see, wow, they're there's never enough money to go around, <laughs> you know, because there are so many moving parts, so many departments that need money for research or so many departments that need money for scholarships, uh, need money to retain highly talented uh, um, faculty. Um, then there's just the everyday aspect of how to how the university functions and how much money we're saving for the future. Before I got on the board of trustees, I always thought, gosh, it's way too expensive college tuition. Why is it so expensive? Uh, how are we going to, I said a little bit in our pre-interview, you know, I as a person in the arts am constantly a freelancer. Some years I make a lot of money, some years I make no money. It's hard enough to think about my future, building a family, having kids, doing that. And I'm, this is not a sob story because this was my choice. So that's not it. But Carnegie Mellon has one of the top fine arts uh, colleges in the world, yes. uh, along with the science and the engineering and the business school and the computer science and, and everything, the humanities. But it's always a, a question of what universities are charging their sticker price and how people are going to pay it back. It's that way across the board, but for artists, it's even worse. So to know that, you know, it's not, uh, it's not totally unreasonable to ask the sticker price because the money is being used across the board, you know, in the, in the best possible ways is, is great to see. Well, that's it. You know, that brings up an interesting question. We just did a podcast last week where we talked about kind of the, the things that are, are, are potentially broken at the institutional sort of at the leadership level and, uh, you know, across uh, universities. And, and one of the insights that comes from sort of Tybel's work in this, uh, in this arena is that really the, these soft skills, kind of the, how to have difficult conversations, mm. learning how to condition, uh, you know, leadership teams to both be effective listeners uh, and, you know, to be effective at speaking truth to power um, is really critical. And and so much of that uh, comes at a dearth of um, diversity of experience and diversity of thought. Now, what you're talking about right now, Manu, really hits home to me because I, you know, I'm like you. I'm a freelancer as well, and I, you mm -hmm. know, as a teacher and a and uh, somebody in the arts and somebody on uh, broadcasting, it it comes and goes, um, and. So I, I wonder if you could reflect a little bit, and Howard, you know, please adjust me if you feel like I'm not characterizing our conversation from last week uh, well, but but reflect for me how well Carnegie Mellon is doing uh, at at injecting some of that diversity of experience and willingness to hear these alternative, um, sort of your alternative experience as the young alumni trustee, um, you know, and, and integrate that into their collective experience in, in leading the university. Well, I mean, look, there's, 
It's my first time being on any kind of board as such, and we have some. And just when, check me on this. How long have you been? Have you served? On the I'm on my year? third year. I'm in, I'm in okay. my third year, beginning my third year now. Okay. So right. I've been there for. So the learning curve was very steep for me. Oh, that sure. being said, that being said, uh, what I've really appreciated is that we have people who have such a, you know, deep experience in the fiduciary areas and the uh, academic areas and in all areas i'm i think the only i'm looking at our our board uh, membership i think i'm the only performing artist on the board um yeah. so it, it's been wonderful that when i do speak i do feel like it's being heard uh we have an incredible president at carnegie mellon uh, super suresh and i don't know the exact um exact numbers, but I don't think that there are a lot of South Asian, South Indian born presidents of major universities. And he's fantastic. He has come in, he came in, I, I, my first year was his first year. And the, the traction that he's making in raising money in, in sort of changing the entire culture in the growth of Carnegie Mellon is astounding. So right there, I think when you're talking about diversity, Right there, having an Asian-born president of a major university who's, you know, able to then tap funding from India. We just received $35 million from the Tata Corporation. You know, that's the Indian, uh, Indian major corporation. But, you know, would that have happened if Dr. Suresh was not our president? Probably not. And not because they're Indian, but just because he's, that's his, his forward thinking. So, so... I don't know if I answered your question, but I do feel that on our board, we're pretty diverse in both experience as well as where people are coming from, you know, to the board. You know, the the thing that strikes me in your earlier comment about uh, graduating and then wanting to start a family and potentially buying a house and and not being too far behind the eight ball, and then whether it's the fine arts or the liberal arts, uh, those two domains – you know, when I was in college, uh, people chose a direction because it was what they were passionate about. And some people knew they wanted to go into a business or into a more of a more of a linear path where they knew that they can come out and generate a next kind of salary. But those that chose to pursue the fine arts or the liberal arts, it really it, there was a trust that. It was something that we would figure out, and we didn't have to really justify to our parents or to ourselves that this is a viable direction to go. Uh, very clearly for you, this is you know you, you are you are exemplifying in many ways being at the top of your field, or you know, and I'm sure for all of us, we're always trying to figure out sort of how do we take the next step, but. This is who you are. You're in that fine arts world. You have graduated from Carnegie Mellon and got that that wonderful gift of the school. But as new students coming in, having to make choices around costs, I just talked to a mother the other day, and and she was saying, you know, I got a three year old, and she did the math in terms of the uh, increasing uh, tuition increases and so on, and she was anticipating, you know, if nothing changes, she's gonna, it's gonna look like four hundred thousand dollars a year for her to to have her children get an undergraduate degree, and there's no question in most of our minds that that is, at some point. This has got to stop, and so what's 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 fascinating for me listening to you, and and reflecting on your physical presence in the board, is I can tell you that just your physical presence is a important reminder to people that we need to be making sure that the decisions around the cost structures, as Pete talked about, the difficult conversations, how do we make sure that people who don't come of means can still come here. Uh, recognizing that over time, our, our population in this country is continuing to become more and more diverse from uh, different cultures. And therefore, how do schools like Carnegie Mellon, who in some ways, on some level, relative to many schools I work with, uh, don't have to worry about thriving uh, Carnegie Mellon is at is in that tier of institutions 
that they have to be mindful of their cost structure, but they're not having a surviving conversation. So, so in many ways, I can tell you that I think your, your, your physical presence without even having to do much, just people looking over and seeing you and recognizing that you represent a body of a kind of students that, that the school needs to be continually paying attention to, especially from a cost structure. That, that was exactly my thought too, Howard. And, and just a few minutes ago, Manu said uh, that, you know, he says, uh, I, don't, uh, I don't feel like I really have changed the, the board structure that much, but it certainly changed me. I find that a dubious claim, and I wonder if you're, you're uh, selling yourself short uh, uh, <laughs> in that regard. Well, well you know, I, thank you. Thank you for that. But we have, a, we have a large board, and everyone is working very, very hard. So if I somehow contribute to that, I'm very happy. But for me, the change for me has been profound, and I'll always be thankful for that. And I, you know, I, I agree on one, I think one of the things that I hope happens around the country and, you know, and today I'm speaking for myself. I hope you know that I, I'm not, I don't represent Carnegie Mellon other than being a, a trustee, but what I, what I say are my personal opinions. Um, but I do think that the fine arts always gets short shrift. And I, I hope that in leadership positions on boards around the country, a lot of times the people who could really influence a university board might not have the capital to um, donate at a high level to be on that board, but their voices are needed because I think one of the things, fine arts in a university setting are, are in many ways, they enhance student life, um, they also are an investment into the future of the culture and the society of this country as well as the world. And if we have those programs there, we do need people who can, who can advocate for those programs on the, on the board. So I, I, I'm very thankful that I get to do that on our board. Howard, you know, when I think about this alumni, this young alumni trusteeship, uh, is this something that you have seen across other uh, boards and institutions? Or is this uh, seems it, it sounds based on our you know last couple of years doing this, it's still fairly an anomalous kind of role. Well, you know, my, my guess is, and this is what you know, real testament to Carnegie Mellon's leadership, is that they understood that we need to put a stake in the ground here and start something. My guess is, Manu, this is the beginning of something. And this is not only going to be an opportunity for you, but for future uh, leaders who are graduating from the school, who represent a voice that are not, quote unquote, the typical trustee, can bring that sense of this is what's going on in schools. Now, every school, every kind of institution, you know, if you're talking about Jesuit schools, you will see diversity on there with, at times, some faculty, but clearly Jesuits. And they're, they're, they, they bring a perspective that is critical to the Jesuit community. And they're not there because of their giving capability. They're there because of their connection to the mission. Uh, what I would say in terms of the young alumni concept is that I'm sure if we researched it, we would see that there are other schools that have done this. I think what's instructive for anyone listening to the show who have an influence into this conversation, whether you are a president or a chancellor or a, or a, or a board member uh, or even a cabinet member is – to start raising those questions, what kind of diversity do we have on our board? And is there a way we can be more systematic about, about honoring these other disciplines? You know, to, to your point, you're, you're a voice for something that could easily get, get uh, sort of put aside in the context of the, the more profitable kind of programs or the programs that, that, there's everyone's gravitating to, which is you know STEM, you know which Carnegie Mellon is n- known for. And I'd argue now we should be we should recoin that term to be STEAM. <laughs> exactly, steam, the arts. Yeah. You know we are known for STEAM. We're not just That's known right. for STEM. And there are schools that you know. It's interesting, Manu, that the choices to change these acronyms. Uh, 
there, there's doing it for the right reasons, and there's doing it because it has a strategic benefit. And and when those two things can align, that's when you're hitting the right thing. It is the right thing to do, to bring to to not lose the arts as a strategic initiative, but it's also the kind of thing for for schools that that want to still attract students that have that to make that front and center as a strategic initiative. And I and I've worked with a number of schools that have started to integrate uh, the A into that concept. Yeah, uh, that's great. That's fantastic. It's that's wonderful to hear because it's important. You're right. Well, it it, it gets to this, uh, you know, to the the challenge of thinking in terms simply of profitable programs, uh, because there are, there are sort of two kinds of profit, right? There's the, obviously the fiduciary angle, but there is also this, uh, the reputation, um, you know, and Car- Carnegie Mellon is, is certainly one that has established a, a significant uh, and sustainable reputation in the arts, and, and to be able to find the balance, there is not just a practical or strategic benefit to that. There is an academic benefit to integrating the arts mm-hmm. into these engineering, mathematics, and technology programs. Um, you know, I, I, a wonderful quote uh, crossed my desk this morning. A great many people think they are thinking when they are merely rearranging their prejudices, William James. <laughs> and, and, and boy, does that just not uh, hold true in this this uh, climate, this discussion, uh, you know, on boards. And what I love so much about the Carnegie Mellon story is uh, how it, it really feels uh, like this is more than just rearranging prejudices at the board level. Well, you know what's wonderful, too, and what I have not said, which you may know or may not know, is the very first alumni trustee, Luke Skirman, he's the CEO of what was formerly called College Prowler um, and founder of that, but now it's called Niche. He was the young alumni trustee that uh, uh, Dr. Cohen asked first. He served his three years, but he did such an outstanding job on that board that they got him back for a regular trusteeship. For He's now serving his second three-year term or first three-year term uh, as, a, as a formal trustee as opposed to a young alumni trustee. And I think that just speaks to Carnegie Mellon. And when you see Luke's work in the board, he's fantastic. He's in Pittsburgh. He's able to, to volunteer. You know, as we all know, these board, uh, board memberships, the, the uh, trusteeship is a volunteer position. A lot of people think, a lot of my actor friends think I get paid a lot of money for it. <laughs> no. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but but so so the amount of time you spend is you're taking time away from what y- you do make money at. But Luke is fantastic, knocks it out of the park all the time. And I think that's a testament to this program. You know, so Pete, you know, after listening to this and you know, participating in this conversation, I would suggest that we have fixed higher education uh, in this one conversation. So I think we need to get off, of, you know, enough of higher ed for a minute. I think what we need to do is move towards ending, giving Manu an opportunity to talk about what he's up to. You oh, know? I so, absolutely agree. Right? Because Don't we want to go there? E- enough of this forget higher ed nonsense. Forget about higher ed. <laughs> That's right. So, so Manu, give us um, and our audience sort of a view of uh, what you've been doing and, and what you have in front of you. Well, what I have in front of me is a wedding. <laughs> I'm getting married. <laughs> You're getting married. Getting, getting married. hitched. Yes. There we uh, go. To a wonderful, wonderful woman. Uh, she's a Brown University grad and uh, a NYU graduate acting uh, grad. But so you can't so have we everything. Won't, we won't she's, hold that against her. Right. You can't have everything, I guess. <laughs> um, as far as my career, I recently moved to Los Angeles, but I have a big play coming up. At, uh, I, I did the stage manager, as you said, in Chautauqua, which was a lot of fun. First of all, Chautauqua was amazing, as you both know. Yeah. Um, I'd heard about it for years growing up in Pittsburgh. But uh, we talking about diversity, my career is all about talking about diversity. Uh, when you're talking about being a performing artist, an actor, and an Asian actor, and an Asian actor in America, uh, those things uh, that... That term diversity is always in the forefront. Uh, and so I was very thankful to be able to play a part like the stage manager, which was made famous by Paul Newman, <laughs> you know, the most exactly. American of Americans. <laughs> yeah, you, can't, um, you wouldn't call him Asian. And by the way, you were brilliant in that. Oh, thank you very much. But, sure. but th- this is the exciting thing for me is that I get to play these roles. I get to play a, a role like Ricky Roma and Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. I'm down into at, that. Uh, oh. Down at La Jolla Playhouse, you know, and, and 
most people, it takes creativity on the casting people's side, and it also takes uh, a sort of warmth of spirit of the audience side. But once that that threshold has been uh, passed, then everything seems to work in the right context. So, so I get to go down to La Jolla uh, in January, and I'm doing a new play by Rajiv Joseph. Uh, it is uh, called guards at the Taj and it's playing currently in New York City at the Atlantic Theater Company but Rajiv won the Pulitzer Prize two or three years ago for Bengal Tiger at the Baghdad Zoo um, and I'm doing that and beyond that planning a wedding has been really really uh, you know exhausting as I'm that, sure yeah, that everybody may be knows enough. <laughs> We know. Yeah, give yourself, give yourself We've a break. We've been there. Uh, I'm telling you, Manu Narayan, uh, thank you so much for your time and uh, wisdom today. We sure appreciate you uh, joining us and sharing your experience. Oh, no, thank you. And please, if you, haven't, if you have kids who are going off to college and they're thinking about the sciences and the arts, Carnegie Mellon's great at integrating all of that, and, and you can do both. So please look at Carnegie Mellon. Pittsburgh is a great town. Look and at I you. Hope- this, you are doing, man, wow. you are earning your role today. <laughs> Hey, no, it's the, <laughs> hey, listen, the truth is always easy. You know? <laughs> right now, the board is they're sitting around and they're all high-fiving each other. Yeah, right. Oh, <laughs> right. We did it. We did it. <laughs> please. No, no. I, I love the place. I, yeah. You know, I can't say enough about it. Of course you do. <laughs> it is a wonderful place. And I should add, we uh, we consider uh, Carnegie Mellon friends of the show. You are you are not That's, the first to join us, and, and I'm sure you I'm not here. the last. Yeah. You know, I'm sorry to interrupt, Pete. Uh, you know, we had Amir on the show, the uh, chief business officer. Yes, he's fantastic. He's a great guy. He's a he, great, he moved he's from a, Southern California back to Pittsburgh, and I moved from, you know, Pittsburgh and New York <laughs> over to Southern California. <laughs> he's a rabble rouser and a scoundrel, but a gentleman all the same. Uh, We're lucky I, to have him there. Absolutely, absolutely. So thank you, um, Manu. Do you, do you have a place where you would like to point people, a website or something? If you, are they interested in finding out more about you or, or just you your— just, You could just Google me. Yeah. Uh, I have a blog, but I, I'll be honest with you, I haven't really uh, done anything with it recently. <laughs> Let so, me guess. Let me let me guess. You're working on the wedding. Yeah, yeah right. There's no time for the blog. There's no, I, I, blog blog about the wedding. God, there I, you I go. It's a wedding blog. I think I want to start a, a consultancy that just gives a personal assistant to people who are getting married. And I know they have them. They're called wedding planners. But I think something even more, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Know, more specific. Yeah. You know what? If you when you when you actually take that out, if you put a business card. Uh, we will do our wedding again, and we'll hire you. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. I'll give you a, a steep discount. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> uh, thank you, everybody, for joining, downloading, listening to the show. Once again, head over to tybalink.com uh, for uh, all the subscription information, or just search for us in iTunes. It's an easy way to find us and subscribe. Howard, thanks so much for your time and wisdom, my friend. Yeah, well, this is fantastic. And uh, I'll tell you, you know, there were moments uh, in this conversation, Manu and for Pete, that I begin to feel, and hopefully the two of you had those moments too, where you begin to feel the power of, of the kind of conversations with people who are committed to these institutions and why it's so important to do this well as we think about future generations and the increasing diversity of our culture. So, so Manu, I, I find that you inspire me because you remind me about how important this work is. So, so I, I found this to be particularly a, a great show tonight. Well, thank you guys, and and thanks for reflecting so many, uh, so much nice energy back to me. I, I appreciate it, and it's, uh, it's, I'll take it throughout my day today. Thanks. Absolutely, our pleasure. Uh, thank you, everybody. On behalf of Howard Tybel and Manu Narayan, I'm Pete Wright, and we'll catch you next week on Navigating Change, the podcast from Tybel Inc. Mm-hmm.